Yo, what's going on YouTube? It's your boy GZTV back with another video. This is the only video we're going to have on Thursday. And we are here to review the 1973 American Supernatural Horror Film directed by William Friedkin. Uh, based on the 1971 novel, we have The Exorcist. This is seen as quite the classic for the horror genre, so I knew I kind of had to check this out. Uh, this is crazy enough my first time seeing this movie. I thought I've seen it before, but then now that I think about it, this was my first time seeing it. So, yeah, uh, let's let's get into the plot. We'll get into the reception, you know, kind of my own review. You guys know how it goes. So following the plot, this is a spoiler review. So if you haven't seen The Exorcist, if you haven't read the book, anything like that, um, by William Peter Blatty, go do that before uh, you uh, watch this video. But getting into the plot... Um, so, at an archaeological excavation in northern Iraq, the Adhan, the Islamic call to prayer, is heard. And this is kind of where we start the movie. It's a really interesting start to the film. A uh, Catholic priest and archaeologist, Lancaster Marin, unearths a medallion of St. Joseph and a statuette representing Pazuzu, an Assyrian demon. So, yeah, already we're kind of getting these demon mythology legends kind of introduced into the show obviously you're not really aware of that until you watch later on in the film and you realize kind of like the origin of all this stuff um, as Marin prepares to leave Iraq he sees a large statue of Pazuzu and two dogs fighting and that's kind of like a sign of the legend I guess so now we move on to Washington DC the uh, the neighborhood of Georgetown University um, uh, where we have actress Chris McNeil um, who stars in a film directed by her friend Burke Dennings. So this is kind of like one of the main characters. There's a decent amount of main characters. We're following a couple storylines here. McNeil rents a well-appointed house with servants and her 12-year-old daughter Reagan is kind of coming along in a trip. Um, Father Damien Karras, a psychiatrist who counsels Georgetown University priest, visits his ailing mother in New York. And this is another kind of like subplot, sub-storyline that we follow throughout the movie. Um, it's kind of weird that you're counseling priests. Uh, I've never really heard of that, but hey. He confides to a colleague that he feels unfit in his role, citing a crisis of faith. He's starting to like, feel guilty about certain things. He's starting to feel super insecure about the way he's living, and maybe his faith is worn down. You know, that's what he's kind of thinking. Um, Chris hears noises in the attic, and Reagan attributes them to her imaginary friend, Captain Howdy. So already, when a child has an imaginary friend in a horror film, you know exactly what is about to happen. In a local church, a statue of Mary is found desecrated. So, yeah, there's some pretty crazy shit going on. Things are pointing to the fact that, hey, this, there's something abnormal happening in this town, in Georgetown. Uh, Chris hosts a party, um... Karis' friend, Father Dyer, explains Karis' role as counselor, mentioning that his mother died recently, and up to the point where they pretty much meet each other later on in the film. They don't really know each other that well. It's kind of an interesting thing how Father Karis almost falls into the lap of Chris McNeil and, like, helps her out with her daughter and stuff. Um, yeah. Reagan appears and urinates on the carpet out of, no out of nowhere, so now we're like, okay, this is... She's not normal. After Chris puts Reagan in a bed, her bed shakes violently and she's starting to show symptoms that she has been possessed. Dyer consults Karis and Karis expresses guilt at not having been with his mother when she died. That's really the only thing he's worried about right now. Karis dreams of his mother, a St. Joseph medallion, and briefly a demonic face. And this is possibly like a vision of his future almost. And I think the movie does a good job of kind of foreshadowing his role in this exorcism. Um... So Reagan becomes violent. Um, she's subjected to several medical tests, which find nothing physically wrong with her. So, like, the medical experts are just looking at each other, like, with their hands in the air, like, what the hell is going on, you know? During a house call, a demon possesses Reagan's body. The possessed Reagan exhibits abnormal strength. So now this is, like, the official possession. Obviously, like, the demon was in her presence when she was acting violent and stuff, but now it's official she has been possessed. One night, Chris finds the house empty except for a sleeping Reagan. Uh, Dennings is found dead at the foot of an outdoor staircase beneath Reagan's window, and hey, that's some more foreshadowing. M maybe not, maybe not like so obvious, but there's uh, some obscure things in this movie that kind of point to like the fate of some of the characters. It's really interesting. I, I think there's some really cool plot devices here. Homicide detective William Kinderman questions Karis, confiding that Dennings' head was turned backwards. Like, 
how the hell that happened? Like, most likely, that's not going to happen if you just fall like that. But, yeah. Reagan's condition worsens as her body becomes covered with sores, like warts, like pus. It's nasty. A doctor mentions exorcism as a remote option, suggesting a possible psychological benefit. And this is the first time this is kind of brought up with the mother. Um, Kinderman visits Chris, uh, explaining that the only plausible explanation for Damien's death is that he was pushed from Reagan's window. Someone had to have used force. This is a homicide detective. He's kind of experted in this field. So as Kinderman leaves the possessed Reagan, stabs her genitals with a crucifix. It's fucking disgusting. Some of the shit in this film is just vile. I don't know. Um, they wouldn't get away with that now. So to Chris's horror, the possessed Reagan turns her head backwards and speaks in Denny's voice. Uh, Reagan is confined to her bedroom. She can't believe it. She's like super emotional. She's like super upset. Obviously, yeah, that's a super upsetting scene to see. Chris seeks out Karis, who visits Reagan. Um, over two meetings, the possessed Reagan claims to be the devil himself, projectile vomits into Karis' face, speaks in tongues, and reacts violently when tap water is sprinkled on her, which Karis had claimed was holy water. A point against genuine possession. This is like, well, yeah, you know. The devil wouldn't know if it was actual holy water or not. That's kind of like what he's saying and what he's trying to prove. So the demon says it will remain in Reagan until she is dead. Um, desperate, Chris confides that the confessed possessed Reagan killed Dennings. Like, it had to have happened. Who else would have done that? So at night, Chris's assistant calls Karis to the house. Um, they witness the words, help me, materialize on Reagan's skin, which is kind of creepy. Uh, still ambivalent. Uh, Karis concludes that an exorcism is warranted. Like, there's a lot of crazy, spooky, haunting things that are happening with this girl. And he's like, yeah, this is a genuine possession. <coughs> this is, sorry. This is not just like a sick individual. She needs a spirit removed from her, an evil power. Um, his superior grants permission on the condition that an experienced priest lead the ritual while Karis exists. Marin, having performed an exorcism before, is summoned. That was obviously the character from the beginning of the movie, and they bring him back, and he's going to do the exorcism. So Marin arrives at the house, warning Karis that the demon attacks psychologically, not necessarily physically. They try to get in your mind and, like, drive you crazy. So as the priests read from the Roman ritual, the demon curses them. Um, it focuses on Karis, verbally attacking his loss of faith and guilt over his mother's death, Again, there's like super personal things that this demon goes after and tries to get in your head to make you feel bad about yourself and demotivate you. The priest rests momentarily in Marin, shaking, takes nitroglycerin, which is like the medicine he had in that little can thing. Karis enters the bedroom where the demon appears as his mother with her voice, not as like the actual person. Showing weakness, Karis exclaims that the demon is not his mother. Um, Marin excuses Karis and continues the exorcism by himself. Obviously, Karis can't be in the room if the, de the demon is tempting him because the demon won't push itself out of the host's body, if that's the case. Um, Karis assures Chris that Reagan will not die and re-enters the room, finding Marin dead. So Marin pretty much sacrificed himself to get the spirit out. Enraged, Karis beats the possessed Reagan and demands that the demon take him instead. And that sacrifice obviously didn't work with Marin, so Karis takes everything into his own hands. The demon rips a medallion of St. Joseph from Karis' neck and begins to possess him, freeing Reagan. So yeah, Karis is a hero now. He pretty much saved Reagan. Uh, Karis hurls himself out the window, tumbling down the stairs outside, exactly how um, Dennings, 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 I can't remember his name, how he died. Um, Chris and Kenderman enter the room. Chris embraces the healed at Reagan, and Kenderman surveys the scene. He's like, hmm, well, that happened to Dennings. Outside, Dyer administers the dying Karis' last rites. Pretty much, like, sends him off into the afterlife or whatever they want to call it. I don't know. So the McNeils prepare to leave, and Father Dyer says goodbye. Um, despite having no memory of her ordeal, Reagan is moved by the sight of Dyer's clerical collar to kiss him on the cheek. Realizing, hey, that these people saved me. 
has to make Niels leave. Chris gives Dyer the medallion found in Reagan's room, and that's kind of what probably led to this being a franchise and like a sequel or trilogy, whatever. I think it's a trilogy with like a bunch of spinoffs and remakes, but that's probably what led to that the fact that hey, this guy's the medallion now. And now there's going to be possessions with Dyer. I guess he's involved in the next film. I don't know. But uh, let's get into the critical reception. So getting into the review and stuff, my stomach starts rumbling. I mean, obviously I haven't ate yet, but yeah. So, um, like, at the time people were watching this film, this was one of the scariest films they've seen in a long time. Uh, probably one of the only scary movies out there, like truly scary movies at, for the time. Um... Uh, it was an expert telling of a supernatural horror story. Um, it's an amazing film and one destined to become, at the very least, a horror classic. I mean, it is. There has never been anything like this on the screen before. Um, you know, the actors were great. I mean, Burston was amazing. The special effects. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what reasons people will have for seeing this movie. Surely enjoyment won't be one. Are people so numb they need movies of this intensity in order to feel anything at all? I mean, yeah, the movie does kind of, um, kind of relies on this thrill factor. I don't think, I mean, I, I've seen, like, movies like The Conjuring, movies like Insidious, where there's a possession going on, and they need to perform an exorcism. I don't necessarily think that a film like this was necessary. I think it's a great movie for the time, and obviously it's a horror classic. I'm not going to take that away from it, but... It needs such an intense manner to it that it has to, like, to be good. I don't know. That is true. Um, the film's half, kind of half successful in that way. Um, you know, the Friedkin's direction, it's to the point performances, the special effects, the makeup, all great, all good for the like time it was released and whatnot. But um, I, I think that Blatty had left out what made like the readers in the, in the book connect with characters in the novel. You know, since the film cannot leave things to the imagination as the book had, that's kind of a problem, you know, book to movie. It's kind of a common thing. <coughs> the film's um, shallowness that has to be taken seriously. I mean, its main problem was being too faithful. Um, maybe it should have broken away from the novel a little bit more. That's another thing that novel to movie novel to movie situations experience. Um, you know, The Exorcist is a chunk, is a kind of like a chunk of elegant occultist claptrap a practically impossible film to sit through without getting distracted or without like wanting to look at your phone um, establishing a new low for grotesque I mean I mean the special effects are pretty grotesque and that's effective though I don't know um, Friedkin's biggest weakness is an inability to provide enough visual information about his characters um, the extra six succeeds on one level as an effectively excruciating entertainment, but on another deeper level, it is a thoroughly evil film. Um, it's it's nothing more than a religious porn film. I mean, the gaudiest piece of schlock this side of like this side of Cecil de DeMille. Um, a lot of people do not like this movie. The aesthetic equivalent being run over by oh my god. I don't know. I think the picture is good. I think that. To an extent, the action is good. It's a pretty intense horror film. It's kind of, I would say for the time it's effective, but the story itself is not that unique. Um, it's quite simply... Alright, I'm just... Alright, I'm not, I'm not going to read too many negative reviews just because this is such a classic and people hold it to a high standard, but there are definitely quite a bit of horror films I would rather watch than this one. That's, that's just me personally, but... Uh, let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments. Le leave a like, comment, subscribe. As always, it has been GZTV reviewing your favorite TV shows, movies. Today, actually, I'm watching the finale for The Walking Dead. Um, and I'll probably do another video tomorrow. Like, I'll edit a Walking Dead review to kind of wrap up the series. And then we'll probably do, like, Black Mirror or something like we usually do on the channel. Stream should be tonight. I'm not quite sure. But, yeah, I'm out, guys.